Uh, okay, folks, yeah, so today it's a pleasure to have here uh, um, a professor, uh, Jussi Falcones, he's my colleague uh, in aerospace departments. He just joined a few months ago. Uh, so, you know, I thought myself, oh, you know, since you are new, it will be nice. Uh, and as an introduction, essentially, to the whole uh, control uh, group here. So yeah, it's a pleasure to have you. Yeah, quickly, uh, Jussi is coming from um, UIUC in terms of uh, PhD in aerospace department, and then she did uh, a one year postdoc uh, in CMU, and uh, she already has like a couple of uh, best papers, like uh, most recently an AIAA SciTech Systems Best Paper Award. So yeah, we look forward to hearing <laughs> your research from you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, today, uh, and. Today we are going to talk about uh, behind autonomy, uh, which is uh, how basically we are seeing the space mission changing in time. So first, to, before to start, uh, I want to go through the outline of what we are going to actually see today. Uh, and the first part is like, why do we need autonomy in the first place for space application? Then we're going to go through something that is called drug modulation for guidance and control. Uh, it's a bit far from, you know, um, you see, but in general, it's like an aerospace approach of using a drug, changing on drug, atmospheric drug while you are flying in the space. And then we talk about autonomous decision making for space application, mission safety and performance, and where the lab, this is my lab, the Space Falcon Lab, is actually going. And then we true conclusion. So to talk about the needs of autonomy, I want to take uh, a moment to acknowledge the today type of mission and take a case study, which is the Mars Temperator mission. The Mars Temperator mission as uh, in this picture, uh, one, two, three, four, five different robots. And uh, actually the overall number is actually seven. Two of them are not here. Uh, one of the two sample recovery helicopter and the orbiting sample are actually not there. So respect to what we were seeing before, we have missions that are really, really long in the sense that we have different uh, uh, mission segments. Uh, and for example, if you take the Mars Temperature mission concept, when you talk about mission concept, basically it's like a representation of what the mission will achieve or how the mission will move forward. And if you take, for example, the Mars Temperature mission, uh, you will see four different mission segments. The first one, uh, the one that we actually already saw, was Mars 2020 with Perseverance on Mars. Perseverance on Mars is uh, a rover. It's actually now on, indeed on Mars and is recovering uh, uh, samples on the Mars sur surface. In the future, by ESA, we will actually send the Earth return orbiter, which is an orbiter that will start to rotate around Mars, um, will start to have communication relay with, uh, in this case, Perseverance, and so on. And this will stall and wait for the next part, the next segment, where we are going to see the sample retriever lander. So another lander, not a rover, so it's not going to have mobility. Um, a lander on Mars, uh, which has uh, two different uh, sample recovery helicopters. The sample recovery helicopters will then start to collaborate with uh, Perseverance, and uh, there will be a, a retrieval uh, of the samples. Then will be sent back on the SRL, the sample ret retrieval lander, which has a Mars ascent vehicle, which will ascend from the Mars atmosphere, the the or the have this orbital set orbiting sample um the, the eject from the Mars ascent vehicle, which will then be captured by the hero, the Earth return orbiter. The hero then will come back on Earth and will avoid Earth while the sample return will start an Earth entry uh, flight uh, segment for re-entry on Earth. So I think just because like Explaining all of this is extremely complex, right? You can see that we have like four segments. I don't even know if these, like these are really changing a lot of times, right? Like this depends on the cause that you have for missions. In, in, um, it's not that uh, uh, crazy to think that we kind of in a space always overdo it. And then like we need to go back because the costs are too expensive. But in general, what we can have here only on this sample return mission, we are going to see autonomous capability that goes from man manipulation, mobility, GNC, so uh, guidance, navigation, and control, uh, 
perception, in situ data analysis, modeling prioritization, for example, which samples uh, we want to retrieve and which not, multi-agent task planning and coordination collaboration, long distance duration operation decision making. It's not really as divided as appear here, but you can pass from function level autonomy to system level autonomy, where basically uh, in the decision making process, uh, you're actually making decision or these multi agents robots are deciding where to go, and what to do with the mission. In general, for the mass temperature mission, however, what we expect to be to happen is that we're going to have function level autonomy on the first four of these. Why not the other three? Because Mars, for how much is actually far, we still have enough resources and for a ground station in the loop approach, which means uh, operators here on Earth that decide what to do. And this is what actually we do with curiosity and perseverance as well at the moment. There are operators that decide what to do step by step. And um, perseverance and curiosity, the two rovers at the moment on Mars, they actually don't make any decision. Usually, you have uh, the um, closed loop approach when you have available spacecraft and robot resources. Space is an environment where we need to generate energy. And Mars is not that far from the sun to actually generate solar power, short communication time, and also the risks are too high. Develop any of this technology requires uh, a lot of money, cost, uh, and uh, um, you know research. and Decreasing the risk uh, requires a lot of research money and so on. So these risks are too high to be injected at this point. So saying that, um, when do we need autonomy? When well, autonomy is necessary when we have changes in the environment or in the spacecraft, when these changes are not predictable, and when the communication time or resources are a constraint. If all of these happen, then you necessarily need autonomy. An example of this is actually uh, one of the situations in which autonomy is always used, which is the entry, descent, and landing. The entry, descent, and landing is where, you know, for example, on Mars, uh, you want to let an entry, descend, and land, for example, perseverance in this case. And in the case, uh, that is fully autonomous as operation because we don't have any communication. It's indeed called the seven minutes of terror because the communication completely loose. And you don't know if you're going to land. Uh, the changes are not predictable because in that case, we have large variability in the atmosphere of the planet and so on. And the communication time and resources are a constraint. We don't have communication. Also, that happened in seven minutes. Also, if we had communication, there was not enough time to send back them for the data. So what autonomy enable? In the, in the space field, uh, what autonomy enable is passing from past to future type of mission, where we are talking about the 1960, 1970 type of mission, so Vikings, uh, which is uh, uh, one of the spacecraft that still we use all the atmospheric density model of Mars to the present, so Perseverance to the future, Dragonfly on Titan. So we are gonna see something that pass from small uncertainties, uh, if you think about what happened around Earth, uh, to large uncertainties, Titan. We have no idea what, what is Titan about. Non-model to complex model, more, uh, more sensing data, more forms, so where forms are we're talking about aerodynamic form. For example, for Titan, aerodynamically, these will be completely different from what expected at the moment, and fewer resources. Um, all of these, so we pass from high predictability to greater flexibility. And if you include all of these, basically you are passing from mission concepts that are conservative to advanced mission concepts, where also we pass from limited prescribed action to diverse, uh, diverse action despite the limited resources. Why do I say that limited resources? Because if we actually just look at this map, this is the launch services cost, uh, what potentially we will see in the next future. So we see that, uh, for example, again, uh, Mars MSL, Curiosity, and Perseverance, so we are talking about around 250, 300 million uh, only to you know, land these on Mars. Um, in the future, the potential range is decreasing from 150 to zero. Uh, so it's actually, we have a cut. And this cut, I am, this is of a year ago, this graph, I'm pretty sure that this graph actually decreased also more because of the current situation. 
So what are we looking for next generation autonomous uh, space mission? We are obviously looking at artificial intelligence and robotics. You, it's, uh, it's funny because in space, nothing is actually human, like beside ISS and also the ISS has only six astronauts and everything else is, auton is robotics, is not autonomous though. Uh, decision making optimization and guidance navigation control. We need to know where we, do, where we go, what we do and so on. But all of this uh, is, has to be in, in a really extreme uh, environment, which is the mission design environment. Cost and mass and propellant budget needs to be in the constraint. Uh, cannot, like, you still want to achieve a specific mission. You want still to I don't know, retrieve samples from Mars for scientific goals. Um, at the same time, at a cost and a budget level that is constrained. So to address these, uh, we will need more intelligent and unique autonomous system uh, are essential for the next generation of space mission, where we still have safety, performance, and decision making uh, the overall mission parameters. So what I work on is indeed this. <laughs> we do work on an intelligent dynamic system integrating AI, robotics, and control the theory to try to maintain adaptability while maintaining cost effectiveness. But also, I'm also really interested in Earth's environmental health. And we are going to see this in a second. So as I was mentioning, I did work on uh, at UIUC and we work uh, at uh, Robotics Institute. and. Uh, I did work in many of these fields, um, but I want to start on where the Space Falcon Lab is going. So uh, these are the main area, the main full trust, uh, where I work on the robotic system that take advantage of atmospheric control for guidance and control, um, decision making that is environment aware and uh, also human level. That means that human can actually will most likely train you one will make the same decision or similar decision where you have uncertain environment and artificial intelligence for sustainability. So let's start with drug modulation for guidance and control. So drug variable control adjusts a satellite surface area to maneuver its orbit using atmospheric drug. So basically what happened is that if you are in space, usually atmospheric density is really low. It's actually considered a perturbation. It's not as you are, you are here on Earth. It's on, in the best shot is a rarefied flow, also less than a rarefied flow. So you have something that uh, is a low drug or a high drug type of, uh, in this case, attitude and control. So you have a satellite that if you have uh, these impinging particles of atmosphere will create uh, a low, what is called low drug. If you rotate it and increase and maxi maximize the area where these impinging particles are, then you increase your drug fundamentally. So this is uh, the equation of motion for uh, a Keplerian equation of motion. Uh, so indeed, this is the gravity, um, the gravity force uh, for um, a point mass around around any planet. Plus um, another term. This term is indeed connected with uh, uh, your uh, perturbation, your uh, drug perturbation. So what you are basically doing here is changing a, so uh, your impinging area to gain control authority. I did this during uh, my PhD for radio braking. Where radio braking basically is when you have a spacecraft that enters in from interplanetary orbit in a highly elliptical orbit uh, around a planet. In this case, it was Mars. Then you lower the periapsis to gain uh, into this specific part, which is uh, the atmospheric passage. Because obviously, it's not that like well, there is no atmosphere, there is atmosphere, but there is a sensitive, sensible type of atmosphere. And so, uh, passing through this atmospheric passage, you decrease your control, you increase your uh, drag, and so you decrease the velocity. Um, this is obviously at the detriment of uh, heat. You create heat uh, in. Uh, uh, passing from uh, decreasing velocity and uh, increasing the heat for the spacecraft. This is something that is currently being done. We actually do, we are actually doing this for Mars every time that we send something on, around Mars, because uh, respect to obviously when you reach the final orbit, then you need to get out from the atmospheric passage. Respect to a fully propulsive insertion maneuver where basically you are here, you insert your spacecraft and you are directly on uh, this lower orbit, 
you requires way less fuel, way less cost. Fuel usually mass. So usually what is in space is uh, fuel equal mass. The fuel mass is like the highest mass that you can find, which is equal cost. Mass and cost are directly related. And uh, But however, you increase uh, so much the time of the mission. So we are talking about here for the like most aggressive value breaking that has been performed about 320 orbits and 65 days. So the idea here was like, why don't we do introduce control authority using solar rotating solar panels? You can actually do this for any type of panels. You can do this changing the attitude that we saw before, having solar panels or using drug panels. So how we do that is we rotating the solar panels during the drug passage. At the moment, what are breaking has been done is always perpendicular to the flow because we want to always want to maximize the acceleration. But in this case, it's, not, it's actually not true. So in this case, we solve the optimal control problem uh, where we are minimizing the final energy while limiting the heat load and, and we are uh, controlling the control input, uh, maintaining dynamics as expectable and initial condition. So based on this, we are we're able then to define a real-time energy minimization algorithm uh, with uh, a heat rate control, um, a heat load control, and a heat rate and heat load control together, which means basically heat rate and heat, I'm not going to go through all the, and, um, the small part. If you guys want, I can go. But um, in general, like the heat rate and heat load control is uh, heat rate and heat load, as I was mentioning before, are the what is the most risky part uh, during I entry in atmosphere. And this is true for every type of entry, also when we enter back on uh, Earth. And so uh, how you do that, uh, you uh, need to control that. You need to be sure that you're not burning. So the energy depletion guidance algorithm proved to increase uh, the delta energy depletion of almost 600,000 percent. Yeah, sixteen hundred percent, and uh, respect to the conventional arrow breaking, and so this means that uh, the time to perform arrow breaking was completely decreased. Um, there is like currently uh, an arrow breaking indeed that will be launched on uh, on Mars so that will have uh, some type of panels. Which, so this is going somewhere. Um, for another reason, another type of research where the idea was still being used uh, was a propellant-free cross-track control for Leo constellation. In this case, we were basically able to recreate this type of uh, constellation using uh, uh, different satellites. Uh, we have a constellation of four satellites, and uh, we were using J2 effect, uh, which is uh, the obliteness effect on uh, Earth, and uh, the drug modulation as well to indeed achieve this and so we were being able here to see how solving an LP problem, uh, how you know you can actually achieve this type of configuration. Again, also in this case, the configuration, the bad part about using drug is that uh, you decrease velocity, but at the same time to to gain something else. But at the same time, you actually decrease your semi-major axis, which is you get closer to Earth. So it's a propellant-free approach. You don't need any propellant to do this type of, and which is good. At the same time, you need to start really high in the atmosphere to use this atmosphere and kind of decrease. Mm -hmm. So then we'll go through what is autonomous decision making in this case. And uh, um, autonomous decision making, pretty sure that um, you guys are really know this part, but I just wanted to add it anyway. So it's when an agent is a, a, an entity that acts based on observation of its environment. So in this case, we have a Markov decision process. So some type of uh, grid with a space state uh, and uh, with a final initial state. And then we have a goal state. An agent uh, that then observe the environment or could also not observe the environment. It depends on what type of decision making you're taking. But in any case, in any case you have uh, this agent that takes an observation at time t0 and then make a decision based on a, a decision making process and then perform the action. So this is called observe act. 
cycle uh, where we have indeed the environment, uh, the observation, the agent uh, that takes in consideration the environment and take the action. And then the action will perform an observation, it will have an effect on the environment, it will create observation and so on. So at the moment, uh, autonomous agent making is indeed when an agent use past observation to understand their environment to pick the best action to meet their goal, despite uncertainties. So at the moment, the method that are used for uh, autonomous agent making is a explicit programming, uh, behavioral cloning, which is just another fancy name to call um, uh, supervised, unsupervised learning, and then uh, optimization, planning, and enforcement learning. So in this case, how was being used uh, the uh, um, decision making? Always considering that breaking approach. So at the moment, as I was mentioning, everything that is being done currently on uh, in space has a lot of operation. Uh, so there is always a team of engineer that is there looking at what is happening. And in this case was uh, a team of engineer that uh, indeed uh, we have this area breaking passage and uh, a team engineer was there 24 hours per day for seven days, um, gathering this data and studying the density data and uh, deciding if to perform or not an auto braking maneuver. As I was mentioning before, in auto braking, indeed, the problem is that uh, you could uh, potentially burn your spacecraft, right? And uh, in this case, um, so you want to be sure that you are not doing that. How you do that uh, using auto braking maneuver? With a propulsive maneuver performed at this passage here, at this apoapsis, which modified the periapsis. And so modifying the periapsis, you are having an effect on what kind of thermal environment you have. Like just trivially thinking like if you get closer to the to Earth, um, your uh, thermal environment will increase, your temperature will increase on the spacecraft, and this could potentially burn your spacecraft. And then all these data were sent back on, uh, on the, from Earth to uh, indeed uh, the spacecraft that decided to what to do. In, uh, obviously, this, has, uh, this is extremely, as I was explaining, is extremely um, heavy, computationally heavy, if you think about uh, this this team of engineers are there 24 seven for, uh, as we said, uh, almost two months. And so it's also pretty costly. And uh, uh, as uh, connected with, uh, you know, people make a mistake, especially when they have to make recurrent, recurrent decision, right? So like when you think about when you're writing an email, writing an email, there is always sometimes that you make the mistake, no, no matter how many emails you're actually writing. And this is because actually you are performing the same, the same decision recursively. So the idea here was to develop a parallel domain randomized team reinforcement learning, PR, DRL approach in a highly variable environment to enable autonomous decision making. How do we do this? Um, I mean, the idea was trivial, which was using the spacecraft that then processed the previous orbit's performance, use stores policies to decide and perform an aerobraking maneuver to stay or not in the heat rate corridor, so to move the, the periapsis or not, so to move this location here. And how did we do this? Uh, through a deep reinforcement learning approach. The, the good, I mean, the reason why it's called parallel domain randomized is because uh, this deep reinforcement learning approach was being uh, parallelized. Uh, so we have different workers. Uh, all of these is simulation based, obviously. Uh, and uh, we had one master. So every worker was uh, indeed performing a different episode and then sending all storing all the data in the replay memory. And then a master was in the then uh, training and deciding what action to take. And then we had this worker that were asking what, okay, I'm in this state, what action do I need to take? And then the master was and sending back the data. The, the idea here was though, like what happened if we train for a big distribution? We strongly perturb an environment. Um, and, uh, and then we try to test outside of the distribution. And so we wanted to see if we had any effect on the generalization, which is the ability to learn a task beyond the specific of the trained environment. 
considering that this is actually like, I mean, the state of the art was uh, pretty trivial for this decision making. Obviously, this type of approach, which is uh, extremely, I mean, I've, when you learn, uh, it's uh, usually it's good if you have made your reward function pretty really well. Indeed, respect to this heuristic, uh, this, um, this approach was uh, performing way better and the score constantly larger reward. Uh, if you see like this was uh, where the heat corridor were being bounded, you can see that uh, the um, learning approach was always indeed in the boundary inside the heuristic knot. And then uh, is able to indeed to maintain this, but also was performing smaller actions, smaller propulsion system. So smaller uh, was using always really small, small, small truss maneuver respect to a heuristic. So, but as I was mentioning, I don't know why this is not working anymore. Wait, you got stuck. We were mentioning how does this perform respect to generalization? Okay. Yeah. So we wanted to indeed check what this was performing respect to generalization. And we used a Jan gap, which was a, a loss between the train, the test minus the train environment. And we, perf we, we checked for what is the main variability in this case. Uh, so for example, we tested for a different um, atmospheric variability. Uh, we did a test also for aggressive atmosphere with dust storm for like if happen a dust storm for 300 days or something was like kind of crazy. This is obviously never gonna happen on Mars. And then we test for a different initial condition. This is what it is. And uh, for different accuracy of the simulator. And we, can, we have shown here that uh, we actually get always really good result on the loss. Also when indeed we are out beside the long campaign. The long campaign happened basically when uh, there was an unseen phenomenon. We knew that that was happening. But the funny part here is that uh, uh, the when this uh, 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 approach happens, uh, uh, the agent decided always to make really small change because indeed the train the testing environment was so far from the testing environment, the training environment that uh, preferred to do to be extremely conservative on which action was taking. So. The mission safety and performance. Uh, so these uh, then like the idea was how do we integrate these two things together? Can we integrate the PRL, DRL, and the guidance collaborator, which the drug modulation approach? And so we have in this case, we wanted to use indeed uh, the guidance uh, for uh, trying to kind of change the variability. Uh, react to the variability of the atmosphere and uh, and then use this decision making approach. And so we have here a train hybrid architecture where it was considered both of them together. Here you can see the orbit, the orbit where you are indeed passing through the atmosphere when you are here in this blue spot. Um, here you can see the angle of attack, which is uh, basically this angle or rotation of the solar panels. Uh, you're going to see also the Q dot and Q, which are the heat rate and the heat load variation in time. And here uh, is uh, the decision that has been taken. So the red dot. We have not, like, obviously, you can see that here already jumped. There is a, this was the decision that was being taken by uh, the, the agent itself. And uh, we then wanted to compare these uh, from a mission design perspective, as I was mentioning before, because we want to see like how this has effect uh, both from risk, cost, uh, and so on. And uh, we can see that indeed, uh, based on uh, what we saw before, we see a, a decreasing in duration, maneuvers number, uh, but also in thermal violation and critical avians. So risk and safety and cost are actually decreased. And this was proved, especially here, when we are already starting to talk about uh, the risk. And we can see that uh, the mission type, uh, this type of mission, uh, we have an increase uh, in uh, a, a decrease in the mission risk, but also a 50% decrease in the total cost that you are going to perform. This initial, the, the total cost that you are going to perform, the reason why you have this 50% of decrease is because we were able to shorten almost like 80% the, the total mission duration. 
So that means that operability are lower, uh, the um, science team is decreasing, uh, and so on. So based on these, I want to go through what uh, are current, uh, the current direction. And um, as I was mentioning, part of the research is uh, through robotic system to take advantage of atmosphere for guidance and control. In this case, um, there is a specific one, which is uh, using uh, um, this rotation, this control, to uh, achieve a cost performance uh, type of landing for small landers. So at the moment, what we are able currently to do for landing is or landing really large mass, actually, or landing only mm, kind of perseverance clearance city mass, which is a medium-sized mass. We have no way to uh, land anything that is really big. And uh, we have, I mean, we can land things that are really small, but with a really high cost. So this is like a way to, can we gain control authority? You can just like, you know, kind of impact something on a planet, uh, increase their uh, structure and be sure that nothing happens. Um, but, uh, basically you are just hitting a miss. You don't care where this is going, where this is landing. So this way instead is like, how can we use the control variability, again, a drug modulation to reach that point, to reach a point of landing that we want while maintaining all of these really not, not that costly. So in this, in, in this case, indeed, we are talking about low cost, a small probe landing capability, but also a large mass landing capability guidance. Uh, as I was mentioning, there is actually no way we are talking about habitability for Mars. We are talking about colonizing Mars. For a landing perspective, this is not possible. And so the idea is indeed having like a type of flight that is closer to what we saw for uh, um, for the space shuttle. So having uh, indeed a variable area uh, that indeed have control authority and you kind of glide. Um, so this type of, this is what uh, currently both NASA and uh, uh, SpaceX are considering to do. And then passive trajectory control for our satellite, which I'm gonna talk in a second. Um, in all of these is uh, the reason why no one is actually using uh, uh, this type of control is because you cre can create instability in your system. You can create instability in your vehicle. Uh, and so one way will be to create, use kinematic flexible chain for drug modulation vehicle stability. Um, currently I'm working on a project that is has a kinematic flexible chain for uh, uh, trying to to stabilize uh, with the array of 30 reaction wheels um, at telescope. And so really small reaction wheels, not the reaction wheel like large as uh, the Hubble Space Telescope has uh, or the ISS. So really small one, the, which are called coats because our materials can just buy as well in your, uh, in your spacecraft and use an array of these and see if you can, uh, um, if you can control your telescope and we are using this, we're using a kinematic flexible chain. The second idea instead is, uh, the second trust uh, is the human level environment aware decision-making. So as I was mentioning uh, before, actually I want to go a, a little a step before. So in this decision-making approach that was being used, we had uh, um, simulation-based, right? Um, in, uh, I mean, we cannot really create any data besides if we are not going to Mars or we are not going to the moon and so on. Uh, in that case, so you need to recreate a simulation and simulation in uh, aerospace, it's quite good because we have models. We have created a lot of models for aerospace field specifically. So you create simulation that are based on physics and then you take data-driven approach to, le to learn, from learn from scratch, which is kind of, if you think about it, kind of stupid from a sense. So indeed, uh, the idea here is like, how do we, and also you don't have uh, neither the safety at that point. If you are just using learning, 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 how do you safely approach all of these? 
So here the idea is uh, how can we use uh, um, simulation from Bayes? For example, one approach could be using this hybrid architecture, as I was mentioning before. The hybrid architecture that I had before, I would like to keep this down, but anyway, the architecture that I was using before, we had the, the trajectory optimization guidance that was kind of saying, so the learning was performing a maneuver. And then uh, while we were in atmosphere, then the guidance was uh, kind of moving, the, um, the was controlling. So while it has a small control, was able then to lower your risk down because uh, it was like kind of a, think about, uh, um, you know, you make a turn, uh, you take a turn and then uh, going from here to your place. And then after that, uh, how you make the turn though, the specific, the granularity is defined by the trajectory optimization. You obviously have a better approach to don't just impact something. So one thing is uh, indeed using this, but what if we use the trajectory optimization guidance to create uh, the number of actions that you per can perform and then send that uh, as discretized in uh, uh, the learning environment. And uh, and so these, you don't learn like completely in an environment you know, no, you know what is the environment that you are learning. Like at least you have an idea, especially in the nominal scenario, what this is gonna happen. And my my idea here is that you actually could gain the generalization and reliability. I the my the main thing that indeed I would like to gain is generalization, uh, because I want to be sure that, uh, especially in aerospace, if I have an environment that I have no idea that that is going to be the environment, I still want to hit uh, the 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 goal of the mission. And then uh, where I'm done, and then about sustainability. So we have the number of natural disaster at the moment is on race on the globe. We have, this is from 19, uh, 1980 to 2020, and we see the number of these is increasing, and this has indeed an effect on the number of billion of dollars that we're spending for just the US every year. And this is not only for, uh, Space, and not only for Earth application, also the space application space is not going pretty better. Um, we are having a number of debris that uh, is uh, increasing. Where space debris is basically this really small. We are talking about like ten centimeters small debris, uh, piece piece of metal that are like running really fast in the orbit. Indeed, this is uh, what you currently see in space. These are the debris that we have. We have something like, I wrote it down because it's like important, but something like 20,000 debris, piece of debris that we have information about. Many of them actually don't have information. And this, um, it's a problem because there is something that is called Kessler effect, that syndrome that performed that at one point when we will start to have a limitation of number of debris in orbit. If we hit impact one of the debris, it's gonna be an, a cascade of, of impact one after another one. And think about, uh, you know, yes. On the picture, it seems to be, it seems that there are two main planes. Yeah. Of, um, yeah. Art. Yes, indeed. It is what uh, currently my my student is uh, is working on. It's uh, it seems that there is a specific situation. So okay, why there is a two plane? This is an equatorial orbit, and this is a polar orbit. We use equatorial and polar orbit for different reasons. Polar orbit are used. Uh, I don't know for meteorological reasons. For um, you can use it for. Um, I don't know, your broadcast, uh, there are specific, or um, it could be like ISS orbit. Uh, it's There are specific orbits that we really like for different reasons. One, because of the, the goal where we are going, and two, because they are easier to access. ISS orbit are easier to access because we can reach the ISS and send from there, and uh, also Starlink orbits. Starlink orbits are really crowded at the moment. And then we have uh, um, kind of nothing, and then uh, um, uh, a gestationary orbit. So 36,000, which is broadcasting orbit. Uh, we have you know, uh, television and so on. And uh, 
the gestational orbit has debris, but the main problem is actually in the orbit. The orbit are the, the most problematic, especially for the how small artists. Gestational, and the reason why also this is true is because the gestationary orbit has a number of maximum satellites. And these number of satellites can be like seven years, more or less seven, 10 years of time, uh, a lifetime. And so in that seven, 10 years, you are not going to send anything else. For a Leo orbit, that's not true. It's not that regularized. regularized. So here the idea is like, Indeed, uh, the uh, I need to fix this. I don't like that things are not appearing at the moment that I want. Um, so, um, how can we use uh, Earth? Um, or how can we use the um, outer space for uh, Earth, especially as Earth application? So, one thing is uh, uh, that um, um, an idea that to be fully on the same page, I'm actually not still working on, I still miss students to work on this, but is how to use the Leo constellation for uh, artificial intelligence for enhanced carbon market surveillance. In this case, uh, the idea is to have a small satellites around Earth um, uh, in Leo orbit uh, that are in constellation with respect to another one. So how you at the moment take uh, Earth uh, uh, Imagery is in really high orbit, uh, and at the same time you have these um, uh, really high orbit, so really good sensor for that. But what if you have just cameras and you are closed and you are using instead a larger field of view, kind of connecting all the image together using different satellites with, together. And so you're gonna have this information quite often, more often than what you're expecting, at the same time in a larger field of view because you have more cameras, right? And so if you have all of this variation, can you use this variation to see how the, for example, carbon uh, level are changing. And so in the future, see what is happen. But in this case was indeed for the carbon market surveillance, which is when uh, um, at the moment, every company has um, a specific uh, number of carbons level that can be sold. Uh, actually not can be sold, but the every company can spend that much, like can produce that carbon level. If they don't produce enough, of that, then they can uh, sell what is living. Or you can plant tree, you see, like the I'm pretty sure that you saw this on, uh, on YouTube or things like this, like, or Microsoft is planting tree. No, this is because of the carbon level. And so in that case, um, what happened is that uh, there is no way to prove that a company has created enough carbon. So they might sell, but they don't, they have used it all. And so can we use space uh, to uh, hit that? Another one instead is uh, autonomous multi-satellite constellation for uh, hazard monitoring. Uh, here it's uh, um, something that I submitted with GPL where basically you have a train of satellites with uh, in a equatorial orbit, uh, 120 degrees, uh, in, uh, in this equatorial orbit, so it's a train, and they have large and small uh, field of view cameras. And so they still like just orbit if they found any hazard, so tsunami or uh, volcanoes or whatever, one of them detect them, communicate with the others that rotate and start to take, um, start to just uh, uh, detect or track the specific situation going on. And all of this is done autonomously. Nothing is done directly on uh, so detection and tracking is done everything autonomously and then sent back on Earth. And uh, the, the third one, it's about the orbital debris removal. We use it in differential drug. So can we use uh, control and differential drug to achieve the maximum number of debris? So for this, I was that informed about the level of where the debris are. Um, finally, and then uh, I'm done. Wow, for me, that's 2.420. Um, this is what I'm the most excited moment, actually, uh, because uh, during the summer, I'm actually finishing up with, as I, as I was mentioning, I just joined the department. It was uh, these uh, three months. And during the summer, I'm starting to set up my uh, lab. And uh, um, I am indeed con considering how to use mixed reality to simulate the space environment. And this is uh, 
for me extremely interesting because uh, we don't have like it's, it's hard to if you think about it it's hard to imagine space right orbit and it's like different type of scale you have large scale small scale what happened to the satellites what happened to the orbit and then a different time frame it happens in in so many scales that it's extremely hard uh, to to see that and so can we use um, yeah I mean we, you can use but we can use mixed reality for for uh, um, testing purposes and validation purposes so with this I conclude and uh, the final message about uh, the talk today is uh, obviously autonomy propels a space mission uh, where we can start to see uh, unpredictable, um, um, try to, to, to go against the unpredictability of, uh, the, um, of space with advanced space mission. We do need intelligent innovation. Uh, there is not, it's not that drug modulation is the only way, but do, do we need to be smart uh, on how we use our money? And drug modulation does allow for a low cost effective type of solution. You can use laser, you can use uh, uh, other type of, of, you know, but the point is like try to use what we call perturbation to your advantage and not against your disadvantage and, uh, um, and perform this efficiency and, and with efficiency safety. And we do have a commitment towards Earth to keep it as it is. Uh, and so can we do use this for, uh, you know, make our own, you know, good part in, uh, in on, uh, on this, you know, overall Earth. Uh, and this is indeed my hometown in uh, Italy. So I want to keep this pristine as it is. So please help me. <laughs> Uh, nice time. Yeah, um, I know, I know. <laughs> so, on, on the drag mod topic, mm -hmm. the first thing that came to mind was a bunch of classical optimal control problems that that I've done in class, and now I have my students do in class, where they try to achieve soft landings on planets or the moon or whatever, and and when you write out the necessary conditions for optimality in that case. The, the solution ends up being a nice bang bang solution with one one switching interval. Now I understand with the drag mod setup, the the reason why your optimal solution, at least as I understand, the reason why your optimal solution doesn't just involve waiting till the appropriate minute and then deploying your flaps 90 degrees, maximizing your area because you're going to have a heat issue. Mm -hmm. right? um, yeah. But is it possible with a with a maybe highly simplified model of the atmospheric environment to set up the traditional state and co-state equations for the necessary conditions for optimality and come up with a, a maybe a, a feedback solution that isn't so simple it's a, a bang bang with one switching yeah it, it's, it's, yeah it, actually that is uh okay so you are saying is completely right, uh, and the feed the try you know the trad opt that I was talking about the guidance. Uh, let me see if I have it here, just like to point that out. Uh, was indeed what you are talking about exactly. Mm. Okay, this explain. I was looking for another co another one, but. This is like explains what, uh, so this is indeed. Yeah, yeah. So basically when you're solving exactly as you are talking, you have a bang bang control. And uh, the difference though is what is happening is that when you are in including, which are not constrained or limitation, when you're, con you're passing from one bang bang control to another one. So you're decreasing your bang bang control. So you're passing like, oh, what happened if you are limiting the heat rate, which you're limiting the maximum angle of attack, you're passing from one bang bang angle. And so you are gonna see something like this. It's not true anymore that is, Papa. Yeah. Um, and the same thing for the heat load. Instead, what we discover is that basically you have this bang bang control again, but with uh, time switching that change. So, yes, to answer your question, yes, you can do obviously something related to that for the control problem. 
uh, where uh, you are including that in, for example, for the other constellation, if you look at that answer, you have, you have again another uh, band band control. But is the switching is happening in different moments. So using the J2 effect, you are able to get to that type of thing. But to, to answer your question, yes, it is exactly the point of that. Yes, excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> you were citing a 1600% improvement. Mm -hmm. in the, um, mm. Yeah, this is coming again from that, this one specifically. The mechanism, the physical mechanism of that improvement, because the hand design one was just being so conservative with heat. No, so what happened, uh, and I wish that I could have had the slide, is um, maybe. Oh, yes, I do have, sorry. Uh, uh, so the reason why is because um, as it is at the moment, we are just limiting where the periapsis. So closer you go to the to the surface of, of, uh, of a planet, higher is your density, right? And so higher in that specific location will be your heat rate. So what we currently do is uh, using these uh, solar panels uh, as always drug modulation, like drug always maximum, and limiting where the periapsis is consider that, consider that point. If you start to rotate instead, uh, what you are happening is that you're getting lower into the atmosphere. Lower in the atmosphere, and when you are in this specific location that is the bad location, you are not passing with dra maximum drug modulation, but you are minimizing your drug. So your heat at that point is not as maximum as, is not that big as it used to be. So you get um, heat for a longer amount of time. Yes, and it, for that reason we are, while the, at the moment are breaking was constraining also only the heat, we started to constrain the heat load as well because the main problem is temperature. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are doing that for longer. So we need to also constrain the heat load and be sure that heat load doesn't overcome a temperature limit because we have two sources for uh, the conventional breaking instead you um, you just fix the heat rate. And it's yeah. successful with that constraint? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So maybe a quick question about this error breaking. It looks like I didn't miss something. You are considering the heat generation due to uh, atmospheric drag. Mm -hmm, yeah. Uh, I remember talking to some folks at NASA about ISS, and they worry a lot about the heat due to positioning with respect to the sun. Yeah. Is that like is that an easy? I can imagine maybe Mars is too far away. No, no, no. Effective. Uh, no, no, no. Because our, like yeah, because there are two different environments in that specific situation. So for ISS, their problem is that uh, you need to thermally, uh, you know, dissipate energy, uh, dissipate uh, heat, especially when you have sun always, uh, um, always on the spacecraft because you don't have any air. So you have no convection in that point. But instead, what we are talking about here is that uh, you are uh, you have a spacecraft that is uh, fully equipped to, to maintain the heat uh, that you have. But also, the, also to be included, the ISS is also generating heat from the inside. So they don't have only generation of solar so sun, but also from the inside, and they just need to start to dissipate this huge, immense uh, spacecraft. But instead, in this case, it's not. You have... Uh, their problem there is uh, the thermal environment during uh, any type of type of entry is really high, and so sun goes from, you know, next is is not that is important. Yeah. Someone is on a gear kit here, so I'm, I'm going to ask you that I noticed in that table about zero point eight errors. Mm -hmm. Is that degrees Celsius zero point eight? Wait, are we talking about uh... like in these tables that you are comparing the various scenarios? Yeah. Uh, with this? No. Okay. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, we talking about this? This is this one? No, we were not talking about this. Uh, the probability. Just, just errors. I think it was like absolute errors. Uh, okay. okay, wait. 
yeah, oh, yeah. this one, yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay, 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 okay. Like thermal variations, mu plus minus sigma. Yeah, this is the number of thermal violation that we, so we define um, uh, a corridor, heat rate, a heat corridor, and checked how many times we were outside the corridor. And so, like always also consider considering not a, la, just the higher bound but also the lower bound of corridor so also if the your heat rate was really really low or your heat load was really, really low coordinates or is this uh, the thermal this is a number the number so it's this so every area breaking ah. perform uh, okay. a maximum okay. heat so how many times yeah how many times you're out of this corridor Last particular per square centimeter. No, 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 no. Number it's of just of oh, yeah, it's just a counter. And so the counter obviously would take on an integer number of variables, but mm -hmm. because you have a lot of samples, that's why you've got yeah, a number. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because this was performed a um, thousand mm -hmm. times or something. Yeah. But I yeah, that's make... curious about what you're measuring. For oh yeah, that stuff. is that's totally understandable. Yeah, so indeed also here thermal this TV yeah. is, is thermal violation is zero point two plus minus zero point seven, which is basically like uh, do, I don't remember how many times I think that a thousand times this was re uh, simulated to for verification, and so this zero point two plus minus zero point seven was uh, the mean and standard deviation of this thousand. Episodes of are you breaking? Maybe it was also more, but don't call me on that. I need to check the paper on that. So on average, you're having less than one thermal violation in the entire maneuver sequence. Yes. Yeah, that's correct. Is thermal violation catastrophic though? Mm. No, in our case, it was not because we were using these was really conservative. So we were making sure that was not catastrophic, but that's a really good question. And also in aerial breaking as well, indeed you could use these push also more the limit, especially because we were using conservative uh, number that are still being used for conventional aerial breaking. So. And I just checked myself if there are any questions inside or no questions. Okay, all right. Perfect. Should we take one more question or we are not Okay, thank you. Somehow it's a nice hometown. I bet it's a nice hometown. What is the name of the hometown? My hometown, Biasta. It's called Biasta. Yes, yes, there. Okay, so <laughs> should open. It's on the east. Yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, it's on uh, the 